Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen hier in der Urania. Welcome to the Urania building to our lecture series Making Sense of the Digital Society. I'm glad to see that you've turned out in such big numbers and have come to our uh, event tonight. We decided to continue this uh, lecture series next year and I can tell you, well, we would look forward to seeing you again next year. Since December 2017, in cooperation with the Humboldt Institute for um, Internet and Society, we've been examining how digital technologies are transforming our society and what a European perspective on those transformation processes could look like. We've had several lectures in the series with speakers like Manuel Castells, who talked about power in the digital society. We had Eva Illus, she talked about the capitalist subjectivity and the internet. And last, the last lecture was Amin Nasehi, uh, for what problem is digitalization a solution? So after all these lectures, I'm very happy to be announced that we will continue the lecture series with good speakers next year. I hope you'll keep coming and contribute to exploring um, societal change, to discuss it, and to influence it with us. In these days where we're remembering the peaceful protests in the GDR 1989 and the fall of the wall, some of the key questions within this lecture series remain of big importance. How does power in the digital society express itself and how is it distributed? Are we witnesses of a revival of democracy through increased transparency and participation or do we witness its downfall as a result of fragmented publics and the limitation of the private sphere? Fair. 30 years ago, citizens of the GDR fought peacefully to be able to express their opinion freely and to rid themselves of omnipresent surveillance. Today, a majority of people is aware of the potential danger of constant surveillance, but they readily surrender to the ecosystems of digital, different digital platforms and thereby become data suppliers and, to say it in an exaggerated way, they become products of some few digital companies. We have to continue to analyze these developments and debate them in society in order to uh, shape digital change together. Against this background, it's a great honor for me to welcome Shoshana Zubov as a speaker here. She wrote an impressive um, book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, which exposes the threat to autonomy and democracy posed by the monopoly power of the internet corporations. Thank you very much for agreeing to take part in our lecture series. I'd now like to hand over to Christian Katzenbach from the Humboldt Institute, and it remains for me to wish you a fascinating evening. Enjoy. Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this special evening. I do that in the name of both the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and the German Communication Association. Um, this evening is special for two reasons. It is special, of course, because of our esteemed guest, Susanna Subov, who is without doubt one of the leading critical analysts of our time. In her work, she scrutinizes the contemporary transformations of capitalism that profoundly change how we organize and live our social, economic, political, and private lives. With that theme and scope, she's the perfect speaker and highlight for a lecture series making sense of the digital society. We started this series almost two years ago with a lecture by Manuel Castells and have hosted since then exciting and uh, almost a dozen exciting and prolific speakers. The series aims to foreground readings of the emerging digital society that address the big picture questions, but at the same time are based on rigorous empirical research. And you can see from her book that Soshana Shuri has done her homework on that respect. These kinds of lectures, as we see today, seem to hit a nerve, given the turnout for each and every lecture, although today definitely um, constitutes a new high in that respect. Thus, I'm happy and grateful for, to see this series continue into the next year, in the third year. So thank you to the Federal Agency for Civic Education, namely Thomas Krüger and Sascha Scheyer, for this wonderful cooperation and your support. 
But this evening is also special because it somehow um, also constitutes a first in this lecture series. Because this lecture today is not only part of the lecture series, it also kicks off an academic conference that takes place the next two days in Berlin. So I have the pleasure also to warmly welcome the participants and speakers of the conference Automating Communication in the Network Society, Context, Consequences and Critique, who are all among the audience tonight, or most of, most of you. So you all have the chance to conduct probably even more informed conversations with your after-show drinks than usually in this series. This conference is the annual conference of the section Digital Communication in the German Communication Association. And it, this year it is jointly organized by the Weizenbaum Institute for the Networked Society and the Humboldt Institute. And I'm profoundly happy to see this cooperation between the two Berlin-based German Internet Institutes. We jointly contribute to the city's remarkable growing research community addressing the digital transformation. For the conference, we chose automation as a theme in order to give the current heated debates about AI and algorithms more historical depth and context. And given the tight connection between capitalism and automation, who could be better prepared to kick off this conference than an expert in capitalism and its digital transformation? So Shoshana, I'm, we all are more than happy and honored to have you here in Berlin today. But before you enter the stage, uh, I need to hand over to our wonderful moderator, Toby Müller, who will guide us through the evening. And I promise your patience will, your patience will be rewarded. Toby is a true master and probably introducing our speakers. Toby, the floor is yours. Get your hopes up too high now. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. What a turnout. As much as I can see, you were all in my back. Now I can see a little bit better. So about a year ago, tonight's much anticipated guest shot thought she would be on the road for maybe three or four weeks, as she told me on the phone. It turned out to be much more. It has been 11 months, mostly, away from home for her, due to the great success of her book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. But she will find the idea of home, as opposed to exile, in her writings too, as a space that is relatively safe from violence, exploitation, or powerlessness. She has asked that question of home or exile 31 years ago in her first book, In the Age of the Smart Machine, The Future of Work and Power. And today, she says, that work turned out to be the opening chapter in what became a lifelong quest to answer the question, can the digital future be our home? As you have heard, tonight's event is also part of the series Making Sense of the Digital Society. And of course, we have talked a lot about the impact of digital technologies on society. But we have also talked about a notoriously hard to define term. It's called capitalism, late capitalism, neoliberal capitalism, platform capitalism. This term is like a giant rock, or several giant rocks, actually, rather amorphous, dark, and very hard to move for a train of thought to pass without difficulty for a conversation to take shape. Tonight is the night where those two come together, impact of technology, capitalism, and take center stage. Because our guest has worked for several decades on how quite different forms of capitalism define the quality and shape the future consequences of said technological impact. Her increasingly warning voice was also heard in this country and given space accordingly by the late Frank Schirmacher, co-publisher of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and head of its feuilleton, as we say here in a mix of French and German, feature pages, art section, both are but weak translations to convey the discursive power Schirmacher's paper had at the time. Her body of work is impressive, as is her career as one of the first women to get tenure at Harvard Business School. But after 11 months of hearing her CV read out to her every other night, she asked me not to do that and uh, be a bit less formal. I find that very refreshing. Most of you have probably checked Wikipedia anyway, or as I hope, have read her book. Speaking of refreshing websites, uh, we're going to try out something new tonight in uh, terms of audience participation. We're trying to get a little bit more focus and a little bit more diversity 
uh, in uh, gender and age when we uh, actually converse here after Shoshana's talk, and is, it is a tool called Slido. May you please <laughs> show us the slide, slido.com. You can type in your questions there. Um, you all have the chance to vote those questions up or down, so we can guarantee that also other people are interested in your questions. And uh, those questions will be read out to us uh, by somebody from the Humboldt Institute for Internet and uh, society. We do have, I think, two microphones here on the floor, but as you can see, it'll be quite hard to pass around the microphone, and we don't really like to give out the microphone. So uh, <laughs> I think the two of them you get, I mean, if you don't feel comfortable with those devices, you do get the chance to ask that question, but it will be, you know, it will be a minority tonight. So please uh, try to use uh, that tool. It's not part of the surveillance capitalist complex, I hope. It's actually uh, something made for something quite different. Uh, and we are, you know, very many t tonight, so please, you know, time is limited, no co-lectures or co-speeches, please. That, of course, should apply to me, too. So, um, before our guest will take the stage, I will let others speak of her. Here's some praise about her book. The New York Times wrote, Light on prescriptivist notions, Zuboff does propose a right to sanctuary based on universalist, if ever more threatened, humanitarian principles, like the right to asylum. But she's after something bigger, providing a scaffolding of critical thinking from which to examine the great crisis of the digital age. Through her, we learn that our friends to the north were indeed correct. Facebook is the problem, along with Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and others. This is the rare book that we should trust to lead us down the long, hard road of understanding." Quote end. The Guardian in London lists uh, the book as one of the 100 most important of the 21st century. And London-based writer Sadie Smith wrote, Zuboff is concerned with the largest act of capitalist colonization ever attempted, but the colonization is of our minds, our behavior, our free will, our very selves. Yet it's not an, an anti-tech book, it's anti-unregulated capitalism read in tooth and claw. It's really this generation's Das Kapital. And Naomi Klein, last but not least, said, the hour is late and much has been lost already. But as we learn in these indispensable pages, there is still hope for emancipation. Klein therefore points out the remedy section, so to speak, which will play a certain role tonight, I think. But we are not going to hear an abstract of um, the age of surveillance capitalism, the fight for a human future at the new frontier of power, but actually are going to get a glimpse of ideas of our next book with Cambridge that will focus on the epistemic inequality produced by surveillance capitalism and why this is a threat to democracy. I'm extremely pleased she is with us tonight. Please welcome Shoshana Zuboff. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, Toby, your appreciation of that work. I'm so grateful. And uh, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Thomas. What a wonderful night this is for me to be here in Berlin to talk about this work. Mm. Toby mentioned my friend, Frank Schumacher. And uh, I do want to dedicate my talk tonight to Frank. Uh, it was through Frank that I became introduced to Berlin and fell in love with Berlin. And I feel like there's a, a piece of my heart that lives in this city uh, and always shall. So I'm, I'm so excited. Uh, of course, wish he could be with, with us tonight, but I'm so excited to finally be here and, and being able to share this work with you. So, <clears throat> there are a few things that I want to do tonight. I want to mm, talk about some of the ideas that are in the book, but also kind of move that forward, uh, driving forward into implications, driving forward into 
a more careful thinking about remedies, the word I was using with Toby, what are some of the things that we can start contemplating as the way that we come together to move through and beyond this age of surveillance capitalism, which, as you know, if, you, um, if you've read the book, or at least maybe read the first page and the last page, <laughs> on the last page I say, the age of surveillance capitalism, may it be a short one. And uh, that, of course, is, is up to us. So, funnily enough, Toby brought up the New York Times, and I'm going to start with the New York Times. And this is a piece from the New York Times. Um, you know what the Federal Trade Commission is? The Federal Trade Commission is the, that's the agency in the United States that now has most of the jurisdiction over commerce on the internet. So when we think about regulating the uh, surveillance capitalists, we're talking about the Federal Trade Commission. So here's a New York Times reporter who's describing what he calls an unusually heated debate about privacy, individual rights, and law at the Federal Trade Commission. And he says, <clears throat> of course, industry was represented there, and civil society was represented there. And um, the, <clears throat> the industry executives were arguing, quote, they argued that they were capable of regulating themselves and that government intervention would be costly, and remember this word because we're going to come back to it later, counterproductive. All right, so that's the executives. The civil libertarians were warning that the company's data collection and analysis capabilities posed, quote, an unprecedented threat to individual freedom. Then there was another advocate there, someone else from a, a civil society organization, and this is what he said, quote, we have to decide what human beings are in the electronic age. Are we just going to be chattel for commerce? Finally, one of the commissioners asks the following question. Where should we draw the line? Now, all of this sounds familiar to you, doesn't it? Does it sound familiar? Familiar debate? Familiar points of view? What's so interesting about this article, it was published in 1997. Right. So, I think we know the outcome of this story. Who won the argument? So the executives won the argument. And uh, they got their way. They got everything they asked for. In the United States, more than in Germany and more than in Europe, but still, relatively speaking, a near absence of law for them to be able to do what they wanted to do. Surveillance capitalism is the fruit of this victory, of a battle that already those battle lines were drawn in 1997 at the dawn of the internet. <clears throat> so, what is surveillance capitalism? It rests on the discovery that private human experience was to be the last virgin wood available for extraction, production, commodification, and sales. People, that means us, we did become chattel for commerce. That's exactly what happened. And the results are shaking democracy to its core. They're transforming our daily lives. They're challenging the social contracts that we've inherited from the Enlightenment. 
and indeed threatening the very viability of human freedom, just as was predicted. Under siege, though it may be, the only possible remedy for all of this is democracy. And that's why we're here tonight, of course. So I think about it this way a little bit. You know the story of Alice in Wonderland, yes? Everybody know the story of Alice in Wonderland? And you remember the white rabbit who had the clock and he was rushing and uh, I'm late, I'm late for a very important date and he goes down the rabbit hole. Well, the way I think about it is uh, two decades ago, we were all Alice and we encountered the white rabbit and he was rushing down his hole and just like Alice, we rushed after him. We followed the white rabbit into Wonderland. What happened in Wonderland? In Wonderland, there were various things that we learned, and it took us two decades to learn them. Okay. First of all, we learned that we can search Google. We search Google. But now, two decades later, there is a fragile new awareness dawning. And it's occurring to us that it's not so much that we search Google, it's that Google searches us. In Wonderland, we assume that we use social media. But now, we've begun to understand that social media uses us. We thought that these are great free services. While these companies were thinking, these are great people who are free, free raw material for our new operations of analysis, production, and sales. We barely questioned why our television sets or our mattresses came with privacy policies. But now we're beginning to understand that privacy policies are actually surveillance policies. We admired the tech giants as innovative companies. But now, <clears throat> innovative companies, by the way, who occasionally made some big mistakes and those mistakes violated our privacy. The difference now is that we're beginning to understand that those mistakes actually are the innovations. Those mistakes are the innovations. In Wonderland, we learn to believe that privacy is private. We failed to reckon with the profound distinction between a society that cherishes principles of individual sovereignty and one that lives by the social relations of the one-way mirror. Privacy is not private. Privacy is a collective action problem. Privacy is a political challenge. Privacy is about the kind of society that we live in. Finally, our most dangerous illusion of all in Wonderland. We believe that the internet offered unprecedented access to proprietary knowledge. But in the harsh glare of surveillance capitalism, we have come to learn that propri proprietary knowledge now has unprecedented access to us. The digital century was to have been democracy's golden age. Instead, we enter the third decade of the 21st century marked by an extreme new form of social inequality that threatens to remake society as it unmakes democracy. This new inequality 
is not based on what we can earn, but on what we can learn. It represents a focal shift from ownership of the means of production to ownership of the production of meaning. This is what I call epistemic inequality, defined as unequal access to learning, now imposed by private commercial mechanisms of information capture, production, analysis, and sales, best exemplified by the growing abyss between what we know and what can be known about us. Unequal knowledge about us produces unequal power over us. And so the abyss widens further, marking the distance now between what we can do and what can be done to us. These growing asymmetries ensure that epistemic inequality will be a critical social contest of our time. 20th century industrial society was based on the division of labor, and it followed that the struggle for economic equality would shape the politics of that time. Our digital century shifts society's coordinates from a division of labor to a division of learning. And it follows that the struggle over access to knowledge and the power that is conferred by such knowledge will shape the politics of our time. These contests pivot on three essential questions about knowledge, authority, and power. And these frame the fight for epistemic rights and epistemic justice. Three questions. Who knows? Who decides who knows? Who decides who decides? The answers to these questions will determine the fate of equality after Wonderland. All right, let's talk a little bit about surveillance capitalism. Because this inequality is forged in the backstage operations of surveillance capitalism. It's one-way mirror operations, engineered for our ignorance, wrapped in a fog of rhetorical misdirection, euphemism, and mendacity. Invented at Google at the turn of the digital century, surveillance capitalism begins with the secret theft of private human experience, now declared as free raw material for translation into behavioral data. These flows of behavioral data are conveyed now through complex supply chains, devices, apps, third parties, into a new kind of factory, computational factories, called artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, where the data are manufactured, as occurs in all factories, manufactured into products. But these now are specific kinds of computational products that are behavioral predictions, predictions of what we will do soon and later. <clears throat> In case you think I'm exaggerating, a leaked Facebook document, and I draw your attention to the word leaked. You know, it's crazy how much we have to depend upon leaked documents and whistleblowers to understand what's going on in these backstage operations. So there's a leaked Facebook document, came out uh, about two years ago, and maybe some of you read about it. It's a document about Facebook's computational factory, which they call their, quote, prediction engine. All right, 
So they're describing what happens in this artificial intelligence hub. And they note that the, their machine intelligence, their AI hub, is now capable of ingesting trillions of data points every day. And that the company is now able to produce six million predictions of human behavior each second. That's what's happening inside the factory. So these predictions are about us, but they're not for us. Where, where do they go? They're sold to business customers. It turns out that businesses are very interested in what we're going to do. They're very interested in our futures. So they're sold to business customers in a new kind of market that trades exclusively in human futures, our futures, like we have markets that trade in wheat futures and pork belly futures and oil futures. We now have markets that trade in human futures. In other words, surveillance capitalists sell certainty. That means they're competing with each other on the quality of their predictions. And this is a form of trade that has birthed the richest and most powerful companies in history. All right, so this was invented at Google. The invention process began 2000, 2001, and um, we didn't start to learn anything about it really until the company went public, which was 2004. And they had to make public their, their initial public offering documents. So here's what we learned from those documents. And this is really crazy, so listen to this number I'm about to say. Between 2000 and 2004, their revenue line, now let me underscore something. 2000, why did they invent surveillance capitalism? You remember what 2000 was? I can't see you that, oh, now I can see you a little bit better. So, a lot of people in this room don't remember 2000. <laughs> because you either weren't born or you were too little. 2000 was a time called the dot-com bust. Everybody in Silicon Valley was going broke and they were all panicked. That's when Google uh, announced a state of uh, emergency. They declared that famous state of exception where they were gonna let go of all of their previously held values and principles, and that's how they invented surveillance capitalism. But the point here is that they were in financial emergency in 2000 because they couldn't figure out a way to monetize, and their own uh, venture capitalists were threatening to pull out, okay? So that's the background here. Let's get back to the story. So between 2000 and 2004, the revenue line, and of course, these are the years where they invented this new logic and started applying it, okay? So everybody clear on this? Between 2000 and 2004, now we're finally gonna get to the punchline, <laughs> their revenues increased by 3,000. 590%. That's a very big number. Okay, so what is that? This is a startling number, and this number represents something that I call the surveillance dividend. That number would not be there were it not for this new logic of surveillance capitalism that I've just described to you the surveillance dividend. And what did that do, literally overnight? It raised the bar for every investment. First in Silicon Valley, in the tech sector, but eventually, of course, this has had effects through all economic sectors across our economies, right? But now, imagine you're a venture capitalist, you're an investor, you're a Wall Street analyst. You can invest in a company that in, can increase its revenues in four or five years by 3,590%. 
Or you can, in, you can invest in a company that's going to do innovation the older way, like Henry Ford, and actually invent a product that everybody wants. Which one are you going to invest in? Right? The answer is obvious. The surveillance dividend. All right. So what do we learn here? The surveillance dividend is the center of this. Surveillance capitalism produces the surveillance dividend, which has driven this logic, not only through the tech sector, but through our economies. Surveillance capitalism is not the same as technology. Surveillance capitalism is not an inevitable consequence of digital technology. Surveillance capitalism is not restricted to technology companies. It redefines businesses in every sector now. So I'm going to tell you a great story about this. This is a story about chasing the surveillance dividend and what's happening inside our economies, all right? And so just to make this perfectly um, symmetrical, um, let's go back to the beginning of the 20th century and the Ford Motor Company the birthplace of mass production as we know it. You remember the Model T, Ford, Henry Ford, the Model T, the most successful product ever sold until the iPod. So today we have the Ford Motor Company and a new CEO, not Henry Ford, and um, this CEO, Jim Hackett, is facing what some of you may know, a global slump in auto sales. Auto sales are down and they're not coming back. What is the CEO of Ford Motor Company to do? Well, if you were Henry Ford, you might say, hey, I know, let's invent a car that will actually compel people to buy it. How about a car that's completely affordable and doesn't burn any carbon? That's a good idea. That's not what Ford Motor Company is up to. Mr. Hackett says, I want to attract investment the same way that Facebook and Google do. So what I need to do is I need to find data. Wait a minute, I've got a great idea, he says. There are 100 million people driving Ford vehicles. So let's stream data from all those people. Then we can combine it with the data we have in the Ford credit business, where he says we already know everything about you. Now we have a data set, we have data flows that are on a par with Google and Facebook. Who would not want to invest in us? Chasing the surveillance dividend. No more cars, he says. Now we have a transportation operating system, chasing the surveillance dividend. And here's what a Wall Street analyst says about it. Listen, this is a great idea, he says. Ford could make a fortune monetizing these data flows. They won't need engineers. They won't need workers. They won't need factories and they won't need dealers. Pure profit. It's pure profit. They can make a fortune. OK. So you've got the picture now. We're following the money. Follow the money. That is the whole point here. An economic logic, human made. Let's follow the money and see where it leads us. You ready? Yes? All right. So to follow the money, what do we have to do? We have to look at the competitive dynamics inside this kind of marketplace. Remember what kind of marketplace it is? It trades in human futures, right? What are the competitive dynamics in this kind of marketplace? I know this is Berlin and you're not used to audience uh, interaction. <laughs> I'm an American, what can I say? I, I, I want to hear from you too. I have, to, I have to know that you're hearing me. I have to know that you're with me. 
All right. So we said surveillance, capitalists, sell certainty. So they're competing on their predictions. So let's reverse engineer these competitive dynamics and see what we find. Well, number one, everybody knows an AI needs a lot of data, right? Everybody knows that. So the first thing is economies of scale drives them toward totalities of information. We need, da we need data at scale. Okay, that's an easy one. Competing on scale is good but not good enough because eventually they realize, hey, you know what? We need a lot of data, but we also need varieties of data. I just wanted to mention that I have some very nice bottles of water here, but they're not open. <laughs> so, so now I have to do this in front of all of you, and you are gonna see how completely hopeless I am. Oh God, I've gotta do this well. Please, please let me do this. Oh, I did it well, okay, good. All right. Excuse me one second, I'm going to get a glass. I guess, I guess we ran out of glasses, okay. Thank you. All right, as you can tell, I kind of have a cold, so. Ow. Water is good, all right. Okay, so now we know that we need economies of scale, but we also need variety, so we need economies of scope, different kinds of data. <coughs> now, even though you're not old enough to remember the dot-com bust, many of you are old enough to remember the mobility revolution, right? So this is the idea that we give you a, a little computer, you put it in your pocket, and you go. We'll, we'll, we'll call it a phone, what the heck? And uh, it will go everywhere with you, and now we can get economies of scope, like where you are, and uh, what you're talking about, who you're with, and um, what transactions you're making, and maybe where you're eating, and what you're eating, and um, who you're emailing, or texting, or what kind of uh, browsing you're doing while you're uh, walking in the park or walking through the city. Um, we can get your voice. We can get all kinds of things now. Oh, and don't forget, what's the most important thing of all that we can get with this new computer? We can get your face. We can get all your faces. Okay, so we've got economies of scale and economies of scope. Prediction continues to evolve and competition continues to intensify. And pretty soon there's a new realization. The most predictive data comes from intervening, <coughs> intervening, <laughs> excuse me, in your behavior. Intervening in your behavior, intervening in the state of play in order to actually nudge, coax, tune, herd your behavior in the direction of the outcomes that we are guaranteeing to our business customers. Hurting your behavior in the direction of our revenues and ultimately our profits. Okay, so this is, this is something new. This isn't just scale and scope with which we're familiar with. This is something new and this <coughs> tracks a process that data scientists talk about they talk about the shift from monitoring to actuation. And that shift is a point um, in uh, systems management where you have so much information about that system that it, the, <coughs> excuse me, the information cascades over a tipping point. And you have so much information that with that cascade, you can begin to remotely control the system. So you, <coughs> you now know so much about it that you can remotely control it. That happens in the management of machine systems. 
Wait one second. <coughs> All right. But now the idea is how do we make this work in the management of <coughs> human systems? Human systems. Monitoring to actuation. Okay. So the idea now is we've got to figure out how to do this. This has never been done before at scale. Automated at scale. <coughs> so this is what I call economies of action. Economies of scale, economies of scope, familiar. Economies of action. How do we <coughs> automate Remote control human behavior at scale. All right. So this is a whole new experimental zone. This is something that has never been done before. It's hard to learn about it because, as I said at the beginning, these are backstage operations. But it turns out some of these experiments are hiding in plain sight. And we can learn something about it. So one of these, something that you probably read about, now I know you're old enough to, to know about this, the Facebook, what they call their massive scale contagion experiments. So they did one in two, one, published one in 2012, another one in 2014. The first one was to see if they could change people's voting behavior, not necessarily who they voted for, but just to get them to go vote rather than not voting at all. The second one was to see if they could change people's emotions, make them happier or sadder. So when the researchers <coughs> wrote up <coughs> these experiments, both 2012, 2014, they celebrated two findings. Number one, we now know that we can manipulate subliminal cues and social comparison dynamics on Facebook pages to change real world behavior and emotion. We know we can do that. Number two, we now know that we can do this while bypassing user awareness. It's undetectable. They never know that we're doing it. That's what makes successful economies of action. Why? Because awareness is friction. Friction is expensive. If I know about it, I might refuse. I might look for a way to hide. I might look for a way to camouflage. So awareness is friction. Awareness is the enemy. These kinds of systems have to be designed to bypass awareness. OK, great. Contagion experiments. Now we're on to an even more sophisticated zone of experimentation. And this one, I am certain that you know about. How many people in this room went out in the streets of Berlin and played Pokemon Go with your friends and family? Come on, audience participation. You can be honest, we're all friends here. Oh, don't be shy, don't be, I know this isn't true. I know you're not telling the truth. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Well, did you know? Did you know that Pokemon Go came from Google? Did you know? So, is that because you read my book? <laughs> so, Pokemon Go was incubated in Google. Now, of course, Germany was famous for being the first country to contest Street View, right? And uh, Pokemon Go was invented by the same guy who was the boss of Street View who was the same guy who invented Google Earth. Before that, it was called Keyhole, and it was invested in by the CIA before uh, Google bought it. So this is a man, John Hankey, who has a long history how to fill the supply chains, how to fill the supply chains on their way to the new factories. So this man, John Hankey, had a little shop inside Google, it's called Niantic Labs, and that's where they incubated these new augmented reality games, including Pokemon Go. When they brought it to the market, of course, they distanced themselves from Google. Niantic Labs became an independent little company and brought it to market that way, so no one would know that this came out of Google. Turns out that 
when you were playing Pokemon Go, you were actually playing a little game within a bigger game. All right, so let's go back to the first round of surveillance capitalism. What was the first really, really successful prediction product? Okay, that was the click-through rate. Because the click-through rate, we think of it as a click-through rate, but actually, just you only have to think about it for another couple of seconds, and you realize that the click-through rate is a computational fragment that's predicting a piece of human behavior, right? And of course, what were the first markets in human futures? That's where these click-through rates were sold, these predictions were sold. So that first market, insanely lucrative market in human futures, was called online targeted advertising. And it's still insanely lucrative. However, <clears throat> we now see that same structure now juxtaposed, um, translated to the real world. In Pokemon Go, Niantic Labs had established its own human futures markets. So they had business customers, not online, but in real life, like McDonald's and Starbucks, the real shops, the real establishments, or Joe's Pizza and Harry's Bar. So they had these businesses paying them, not for guaranteed click-through, but for guaranteed footfall, people's real feet falling on the real floor of real places, guaranteed footfall. And so the idea with Pokemon Go was how to use gamification, the rewards and punishments of gamification, in order to herd people through the cities to the places where their feet were guaranteed to be. Right? So that's another phase in the work of economies of action and figuring that out. Now, here's another phase. Comes a little bit later, and now we're back at Facebook. And this comes from another leaked document, this one written by Australian Facebook executives. And, well, I don't know if they were, they were Australian, let me put it, let me put that another way. This was written by Facebook executives written for its Australian and New Zealand customers. I've always kind of assume, assumed that the executives were Australian, but I don't know that for a fact. Okay, so this is a report that is selling its business customers on the following idea. We have so much information. Now remember, monitoring to actuation. We have so much information on 6.4 million young people, high school students, college students, and young adults in Australia and New Zealand, that we can now predict their emotional state on a daily and weekly basis. We can see their emotional cycles across the seven days of the week, and we can predict where they are going to be in this emotional cycle. We can predict things like if they feel stressed, defeated, overwhelmed, anxious, nervous, stupid, silly, useless, or a failure. And with these predictions, we can alert you to the exact moment of maximum vulnerability when, if you send a message that contains a confidence boost, you will be successful. So for example, let's imagine that you have um, a sexy black leather jacket to sell. Well, we can tell you when to sell it, how to sell it, what to say in your message, and by the way, make sure they know you're gonna sell it on a Thursday night because that's when they're most anxious because the weekend is about to appear. Tell them that you can have it delivered for free to their door the next morning. Throw in a little price discount and we can guarantee you success. 
All right, so that's another phase, economies of action, monitoring to actuation. Finally, we're seeing the next phase un unveil itself now, literally as we speak. Some of you who follow smart city, smart city developments might know that just the other day, the officials in Toronto made some decisions about how Sidewalk Labs, Sidewalk Labs is the subsidiary of Google slash Alphabet that specializes in its smart city work. You know that they used to call it the Google City, but they don't do that anymore. They call it the smart city. Smart city, uh, they're trying to get the waterfront area in Toronto to rebuild as a Google city. And this uh, is a dynamic that's been going on for a couple of years, become very contested with many citizens getting involved. And just the other day, um, some of these officials in Toronto actually made a very good decision and uh, curtailed the, the development of this plan substantially. But the, the key point here is that when you look at the documents behind this um, Sidewalk Labs proposal, and, um, and in fact, just last week, the Globe and Mail found some secret documents, documents that really hadn't been reviewed by the public and, and, uh, and finally made them public. And it's fascinating what you see there because um, all of these documents, if you read them with what we've just been talking about in mind, these are documents that are a clear declaration of epistemic dominance and, and the intention to use that dominance for behavioral modification at scale. I'm not gonna go into the, into the details, but you can trust me on that. All right, so, um, you know, sometimes I hear people saying to me, you know, Shoshana, I mean, take your point, but really, Businesses, advertisers, commerce, always try to persuade people. You know, always try to change people's behavior and get them to buy something that they didn't want to buy. So really, Shoshana, there's nothing new about this. And of course, that's true. There is nothing new about our desire to persuade each other to do things that we might not have otherwise done, or maybe to do things that we don't even want to do. There's nothing new about human persuasion. But let's not lose our bearings. Because what is new here is that at no other time in history have the wealthiest private corporations had at their disposal a pervasive global architecture of ubiquitous computation able to amass unparalleled concentrations of information about individuals, groups, and populations sufficient to mobilize the pivot from the monitoring to the actuation of behavior remotely and at scale. This, my friends, is unprecedented. What is this new power? It works its will through the medium of digital instrumentation. It's not sending anybody to our homes at night to take us to the gulag or the camp. It's not threatening us with murder or terror. It is not totalitarian power. But it is a new and unprecedented form of power just as totalitarian, totalitarianism, totalitarianism presented itself as a new and unprecedented power in the 20th century. This new power is what I call instrumentarian power. It works its will remotely. It comes to us secretly, quietly. And if we ever know it's there, it might actually greet us with a cappuccino and a smile. <laughs> Nevertheless, it represents a global means of behavioral modification and is the engine of growth for surveillance capitalism. Okay, 
So here we, we've now climbed a mountain. We've climbed the mountain of the division of learning. And we've peeked inside the fortress, into the AI hub, into these backstage operations. And what have we found? A frontier operation run by geniuses, funded by immense amounts of capital. Are they solving the climate crisis? Are they curing cancers? Are they figuring out how to get rid of all those plastic particles that now even are detectable in the Arctic snow? No, they're not doing any of that. Instead, all of that genius and all of that capital is dedicated to knowing everything about us and pivoting that knowledge to the remote control of people for profit. I, I don't like that. This is how the age of surveillance capitalism becomes an age of conquest. So, you know, we're meant to sleepwalk through all of this. We're meant to be ignorant. This is engineered for our ignorance. Mark Zuckerberg says privacy is the future. Very confusing. <laughs> they just really think that we're stupid. And because we're meant to sleepwalk through this, when something actually rises up out of the fog to send us a message, well, it's crazy. I mean, it really gets our attention. This is what happened with Cambridge Analytica, isn't it? Chris Wiley, here's the whistleblower now. Chris Wiley says, this is what we've been doing. That really got our attention. Let's just take a minute and look at what Chris said Cambridge Analytica was doing. He said, quote, we exploited Facebook to harvest millions of people's profiles. And then we built models to exploit what we knew about them and target their, target their inner demons. Does that sound familiar? Does it? He says, <clears throat> the objective was behavioral micro-targeting, influencing voters based not on their demographics, but on their personalities. Does that sound familiar? He says, I think it's worse than bullying, because at least with bullying, uh, <clears throat> people know what's being done to them. They have some kind of agency. With what we do, he said, people don't even know what's being done to them. He says, if you do not respect the agency of people, then anything you're doing after that point is not conducive to a democracy. Well, yeah, that's for sure. All right, so then he concludes. He says, Cambridge Analytica was information warfare correctly acknowledging that information warfare originates in epistemic inequality. Information warfare is impossible to prosecute without that information dominance, that information advantage. But what remains poorly understood even today is that Cambridge Analytica only repeated the mechanisms and methods that represent everyday life for every self-respecting surveillance capitalist. I mean, what more um, apt description of the treatment of those young people in Australia and New Zealand uh, whose social anxieties were manipulated for profit uh, than to say we built 
models to exploit their inner demons. I mean, how apropos is that? So here is a, this political consultancy that got the world's attention and still has the world's attention when actually all it was was a parasite a parasite in the host. And the host body was not just Facebook. The host body was surveillance capitalism itself. It's surveillance capitalism that provided the three things that the people who study information warfare say are essential for its success. The conditions, the weapons, and the opportunity. It was surveillance capitalism that provided the conditions through the ubiquitous datification of human experience. It was surveillance capitalism that provided the weapons, the data, the methods, and the mechanisms, the predictive analyses, the intimate simulations of individuals, the behavioral micro-targeting, the techniques for subliminal influence and manipulation of social comparison dynamics, the mastery of hidden real-time experimentation, all of it pioneered in surveillance capitalism, the weapons. And finally, it was surveillance capitalism that provided the opportunity. The opportunity being uh, <clears throat> the fact that uh, all of these uh, mechanisms can be applied while completely circumventing human awareness. It can all be done in secret. And that provides a massive opportunity for successful information warfare. The conclusion can only be that what we have failed to recognize is that it's not that Cambridge Analytica represents information warfare. And it's not that information warfare is strictly a function of the state or increasingly of even non-state but political actors. It turns out that surveillance capitalism and its illegitimate use of knowledge to power is best understood as the normalization and the institutionalization of information warfare for profit. That is the world that we are living in today. Okay. So, <clears throat> I want to conclude with just um, a couple of thoughts uh, that will allow us to turn the lights on in a, in a minute without everybody feeling really depressed. <laughs> because you may not be able to tell right now from my voice, which is a little warped, but I'm actually very optimistic about our ability to change this. And in fact, I'll be very candid with you. Some of my optimism comes from uh, your country. Uh, some of my optimism comes from seeing uh, how the generations in your country and in this city uh, learn to uh, confront and in internalize the lessons of totalitarianism and uh, completely change the fabric of your culture and your institutions and your laws. And I have so much respect for that. And I think it reminds us of a larger, a larger pattern here which is that as democratic societies, we have confronted grave problems in the past and we have overcome them. We ended the Gilded Age. 
We overcame totalitarianism. And in fact, uh, uh, we have used the levers of our democracy in order to ensure that the post-war world became a prosperous world for ordinary people. That the post-war world was the age of the middle class. And that capitalism and uh, market capitalism could actually promote and itself be strengthened by democracy. And that was part of the legacy of the post-war years. So now we're living in a time when we understand that privacy is a collective action problem. And we have to look now to only one source for remedies here, and that source is democracy. That means law, and that means new regulatory paradigms. And when we're talking with Toby, we can get into more details on this, but I want to call your attention to at least two things that I think are immediately important. And um, once we start talking about them and begin to get used to them a little bit in our imaginations, they won't sound as strange as they might sound when I say them right now. The key thing that confronts us here is to interrupt the incentives for the surveillance dividend. We essentially need to outlaw the surveillance dividend. Once we do that, we open up the competitive space for the thousands and hundreds of thousands and indeed millions of young people, entrepreneurs, companies who want to produce digital products and services that will address climate, that will address our real needs, that will cure the cancers that plague us, that will do all of the things that we once expected from the digital. But they will be able to do them without having to compete on the surveillance dividend. That's what we need. So <clears throat> two things I want to suggest. One is that we interrupt supply, and the other is that we interrupt demand. By interrupting supply, I mean that the illegitimate, secret, unilateral taking of human experience for translation into data should be illegal. The surveillance capitalists have fought. This fight that you heard about in 1997 continues literally every day. They have fought for the right to take our faces whenever and wherever they want to. They take our faces on the street. They take our faces in the park. They take our faces when and wherever they want to. Our faces go into their facial recognition systems. Facial recognition systems train data sets. Data sets, we now find out, often sold to military operations, military divisions, including those military operations that are imprisoning members of the Uyghur minority in central China in an open air prison where the only walls are facial recognition systems. That's what I mean, by the way, privacy is not private. Okay, so we interrupt supply. The next thing that we can do is interrupt demand. And that means we eliminate the incentives to sell predictions of human behavior. How do we do that? We make markets that trade in human futures illegal. Other markets are illegal. Markets that trade in human organs are illegal. Why? Because they have predictably destructive consequences for people and for democracy. Markets that trade in human slaves 
are illegal because they have predictably destructive consequences. Markets that trade in human babies are illegal because they have predictably destructive consequences. Markets that trade in human futures should be illegal because, first, they are the enemies of human autonomy because their competitive dynamics require economies of action for which human agency is the enemy. And second, because they inevitably produce the extreme asymmetries of knowledge and the power that accrues to knowledge that create epistemic inequality and epistemic injustice. Okay. So, <laughs> now, we're at the end. What do I want to say to you? And now, the question is, not are you, are you um, old enough to know this, but are you young enough to know this? <laughs> Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg says, our house is on fire, succinctly framing the climate crisis, cataclysm. Our house is on fire. So I'd like to suggest that global warming is to the planet, our house, what surveillance capitalism is to society, our home. Not only is our house on fire, but our home is on fire. This fire, though, is not kindled in the implacable physics of the climate crisis. It's kindled in a human-made logic, a human-made economic logic. Anything that humans make can be unmade. All we have to do is decide, like the Berlin Wall. You decided, and ultimately it came down. <coughs> Surveillance capitalists are rich and powerful, but they are not invulnerable. They have an Achilles heel. Do you know what that is? They fear law. They fear lawmakers who are not confused in, and intimidated. But ultimately, they fear you. They fear citizens who are ready to demand a digital future that we can call home. Thank you. I just want to say, um, I did have my watch up there. <laughs> it didn't do me much good, though, did it? <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That means the world to me. It really does. I'm doing a lot worse than you with the bottle here, actually. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Behold. <laughs> yes, it's open. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, Toby. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shoshana, for that very interesting outline, uh, again, on surveillance capitalism and uh, for the call to arms, so to speak, uh, at the very end. And uh, I would l actually like to start this conversation by referring once again uh, to the city we're in. Um, you know, even I am uh, not old enough, that may come as a surprise to most of you, uh, <laughs> to have witnessed the fall of the wall here in Berlin. That's because I'm not German. I was in another small uh, European country, but um, 
you know, apparently everybody knows that obviously it was the GDR was a state that relied heavily on uh, analog surveillance. It was estimated that about roughly 200,000 people uh, were on the payroll of the secret police of the Stasi in a state, in a nation that, you know, had how many? 16 millions uh, inhabitants. So there's a conversation about um, how surveillance changes behavior there when it comes to analog uh, surveillance. I mean, it's still a difficult conversation to have in Germany, actually, but the conversation is there. You know, we have talked about this uh, for quite a while. In terms of speech, public movement, action taken, action not taken, uh, things like that. But I'm wondering, 2013, after the Snowden leaks, after that story broke, you know, all over the world. Is there, a much, is there much of a widespread discourse on how mass surveillance changes, modifies our behavior, actually, you know, commodifies our traces uh, uh, of the behavior? What do you think? In what ways has surveillance capitalism already changed uh, our behavior so far? Because I don't hear a lot about that. Well, I mean, I, I think it's, um, yeah, it changed our behavior and um, probably you know I, I think maybe the younger we are mm -hmm. the younger one is the more one's behavior is likely to have been changed and the less uh, the less one has any possibility of even knowing that <laughs> Um, so, we can see changed behavioral patterns, but it's, you know, it's not necessarily within the self-consciousness of a young person that their behavior is, Goes unnoticed, is, so is, uh, is changed. Huh. Um, but, you know, this kind of um, entrapment in the psychology of adolescence I uh, write about the life of the hive, mm -hmm. you know, the idea that uh, we're, we're living in a way that is so um, hyper-attuned to one another. And um, it appears to be that, you know, young people really have been drawn into this kind of, uh, this kind of operation um, so profoundly. But there's that interesting age group. I love talking to um, university students, um, probably some, some people in this room. I, I had a really moving experience. It was um, late 2017 and I, I went up to visit, um, do some lecturing and teaching at um, King's College, uh, <coughs> Ontario. <coughs> up in Canada, in Kingston. And my favorite thing is being with undergraduates, you know, college students. And we had this wonderful conversation about uh, Irving Goffman. Mm -hmm. You remember Irving Goffman, you know? A great the social theorist of the uh, mid 20th century, presentation of self in everyday life. And uh, Goffman, you know, part of that group, like Stanley Milgram, um, you know, the great studies um, that came out of the war and the post-war environment. And Goffman talked about the uh, presentation of self, and he wrote about this idea of backstage. And, as, you know, essentially he said, like, if you don't have a backstage, you're going to go crazy. <laughs> because backstage is where you get to be yourself and you get to replenish yourself. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where everyone's just hanging out. No one's judging anybody and, and so forth. And without backstage, you go nuts. And so I, I, this, group of, this, this group of students, it was a big class, and they had been reading these theorists like Goffman. And I said, well, everything we're talking about that you do on Facebook and so on, curating your persona for different audiences and so forth, isn't that just 21st century Goffman? Isn't that just presentation of self in the digital world. So there was a debate about that. And then this young woman bega began to speak. Her name was Helen. And, um, and she was 
feeling and thinking in real time. And she began to speak and she said, it's not the same. And I've just, I've just realized it's not the same because we have no backstage. There is no place I can be that is backstage. This morning I was walking across the campus and I thought I was backstage, lost in my own thoughts, and I looked up and I saw somebody over there with their phone taking my picture. There's no backstage. And the whole room, it was a big, big room, not quite as big as this, but it was one of those big classes. Everybody went quiet. Photography is a very interesting example to, to talk about uh, privacy, actually. Um, I think the notion of privacy that, you know, that I think is so central to a lot of your arguments uh, you're making. You know, the mistakes are the innovation you said at the beginning uh, of your talk, and that's, of course, an invasion of privacy, or meant at that time, I think, an invasion of privacy. Now, if you look at that um, a little historically, that's what I mean with press photography in the late 19s. Uh, century, right, which led to a canonical text. Uh, of course, you know, uh, you know it in the history of privacy. You lost the right to privacy by Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis. At uh, when was that? 1819, actually, in the Harvard Law Review. The philosopher Raymond Geuss, um, professor emeritus uh, at Cambridge, tells the story who had actually inspired this nowadays canonical text when it comes to the uh, you're, right you're of privacy. You're telling all my good stories. <laughs> well, the story went like this: this that uh, yeah, <laughs> that uh, the wife of I think it was Samuel Warren's wife. It was a rich society lady. And I think uh, Warren, Warren himself was very upset about this. He was very upset about this, right? That press reporters actually sort of invaded or uh, reported on the parties he or his wife or the two of them threw together. So it was a very uh, concrete instance actually that led to this canonical text. Nowadays people post the pictures of their parties, you know, free of will. I mean, nobody forces them to do that. So what I want to get at historically, in other words, privacy is a very unstable concept, as we can see now when it comes to uh, photos. But what about today? Do you think we can frame a universal <laughs> concept of what privacy is? How would you describe that? What would mean privacy today? Well, you know, I mean, I was um, I was reading some some of my materials today, uh, just reminding myself of that great quote from Mark Zuckerberg. I think it, I think the quote was from 2011, when he said, um, "We just decided that there would be no privacy, and that would be the new social norm, and we went for it." And so, rather than, uh, you know, so, so what we've seen is this, um, this assault on, you know, there had been this sort of evolutionary process of privacy. Privacy, of course, is an idea that is only relevant to the growth of uh, the evolution of, of the, the psychological individual and the, the progressive individualization through history, which is an arduous and um, an, an arduous evolution and one to be celebrated. Because with the concept of the individual came the concept of rights. And with the concept of rights came the concept of democracy and equality. So privacy is part of this nest of of values and sensibilities that are so essential uh, to the, the, the way of, of, of life that, uh, that is associated with the, uh, the, the growth and the, um, you know, the, the, the health of our democracies, the possibility of our democracies. So for, so what's fascinating is that Facebook simply decided there would be no privacy. And what happened? Initially, what happened? What happened was the world exploded in outrage. You know, we didn't just accept it. People all over the world were really, really angry. It's like we talked about Street View before. There were 
nobody actually knows how many lawsuits there were against Google because of Street View. But they were coming from almost every country on earth. Germany started, Hamburg, but, uh, you know, there was outrage and protest. So, but these, these lines were crossed. And uh, there's habituation and there's normalization and there's what I call psychic numbing. So this goes with what we were just talking about a minute ago, what Helen said. There's no backstage. If there's no backstage, you start to go crazy in a certain kind of way. And what do you do to protect yourself from that feeling of craziness? You go numb. And so there's a lot of psychic numbing right now because we are all increasingly experiencing this world of no escape. And in order to protect ourselves from these feelings of going crazy, we kind of get numb and we stop thinking about it. You know, or we console ourselves with uh, privacy uh, browsers and uh, ad blockers and things like that, or you know, how to increase encryption or or maybe you're into the camouflage, you know, those special materials that you can buy to put over your face and confound facial recognition cameras and so forth. But um, so I don't know that we've given up on privacy so much as that we yearn for it. It's become unavailable and that makes us feel kind of sick and crazy and so we're protecting ourselves from that until we can figure out a way through. Uh, in which case, something that you and I have talked about a little bit, Toby. Um, you know, I happen to believe that if we can get rid of the surveillance dividend and really open up the competitive playing field, we're, we're at a moment in history where any, any business that comes on stream giving us the things that we actually want the way we want them without the overhang of these externalities that come with the surveillance dividend, these anti-democratic and anti-egalitarian externalities, um, that that company or those companies really have the opportunity to have every person on earth as their customer. Because according to literally every survey in Europe, every survey in the United States, uh, Nobody wants this stuff. Nobody likes it. Nobody wants it. There's just very little choice. You mentioned that, um, you know, 20 years ago, uh, we thought that the Internet was going to be about empowering the consumer now, uh, right? And now we ended up as, um, you know, we're in the era of the end of the consumer, as you put it uh, um, in, in the book, I think. The end of the consumer being the raw material yeah. for the profit. Other people call it labor, even. It should be, you know, another uh, concept. But what I'm interested is for now, for the moment, before we open this up to you in the tipping point, what happened in the evolution of, say, managerial capitalism to distributed capitalism and then advocacy-oriented capitalism and made, you know, that fight loose and so surveillance capitalism won by actually destroying the consumer. What kind of forces um, are there? Is this about continuity or discontinuity? Or in other words, how much capitalism is in surveillance capitalism that's always been there? Or is this really <laughs> a break as, a dis as in a discontinuity? You know, I, I would say it's both. I mean, um, surveillance capitalism you know, replicates the age-old evolution of capitalism, claiming things that live outside the market dynamic, bringing them into the market for commodification, uh, for production and sales. Um, but what's crazy about this era of that pattern is that um, it's, not, it's not simply about taking uh, you know, nature, as in the case of industrial capitalism, uh, to be uh, reborn as commodities for sale and purchase. But now it's, it's about taking human nature. It's about taking private human experience. And that sets into motion all these other kinds of dynamics that, that we've been talking about. But having said that, there are also, I think, very, very powerful ways in which surveillance capitalism um, diverges 
from the history of capitalism. Uh, not only does surveillance capitalism not have, okay, let me put it this way. Surveillance capitalism breaks with the history of capitalism because it no longer has to sustain organic reciprocities with its own societies, with its own populations, right? Consumer, right? right? For two reasons. One is because it doesn't need us as its source of customers. We are not its customers, as has already been pointed out. I won't repeat. But also because it doesn't need us as a source of employees. It's not accurate to say we supply the labor. Uh, because if we were labor, then we would be the workforce. And that's a source of reciprocity. Don't forget, democracy, you know, the, the amplification of democracy in Great Britain in the late 19th century was directly linked to the dependence of the elites on the working class. They understood that if they did not expand the franchise, the people who worked for them were likely to burn down their factories. So uh, that, those reciprocities, that's, that's not just like an abstraction, that's, that's real life. The same with consumption. I mean, you know, there's wonderful historiography really looking deeply at the American Revolution as a consumer revolution. That the colonists actually, uh, you know, were finally molded into uh, a shared, uh, you know, a sense of shared political interests across these disparate colonies because they were all outraged at how they were being treated as consumers. And when they wanted to protest, they said, we will cease to buy your products. I'll go without a winter coat. I'll go without tea. Right, so this is very real stuff that's intrinsic to the history of democracy. So that they don't need us as consumers and they don't need us as workers is a really big deal. And that is uh, a tremendous difference from the history of democracy, from the history of capitalism, and, a, and I think a key reason why, you know, cap democracy and capitalism have found a way to cohabitate uh, especially, you know, from the late 19th and especially uh, in, the, in the middle uh, of the 20th century. Market democracy turned out to be uh, a very powerful and, and prosperous kind of structure. Um, uh, but is very unlikely as long as surveillance capitalism is, is the dominant market form. Let us switch to the new tool, Slido. Natalie, do you have uh, questions now, ready have you, for us? Have you, have... Pardon me? It's not an equal conversation. Yeah, there's a reduction in the, we've been trying this out this evening. It's the first time we're trying it out. Uh, I was not there with Castell. I'm sorry, we are trying this out tonight. Um, okay. <laughs> We're still trying it out. <laughs> I'm going to put the slide up. Okay, All right. where's Natalie? Um, should we start with the questions from this tool? Uh, we have received more than 150 questions, so we kind of had to put thematic blocks um, on them. And one of them... <laughs> All right. This is um, like Berlin in the 90s. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it's coming back. Resist. But we're trying out this tool. Please respect that. <laughs> All right, um, so first block is about regulation, about lawmakers, and, um, hmm? huh? 
Can we go on? Okay, great. Um, so, for example, should big tech companies be broken up as Elizabeth Warren proposes? Um, is this a viable way forward? And on the other side, what policy should the EU put in place to limit the power of companies like Facebook and Google? So, which, yeah, which regulation forms can be used for that? Okay, well, great question. So glad you asked. Um, 150 questions, I think we're going to have to get our sleeping bags out. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about antitrust law, these, um, uh, the whole body of anti-competitive uh, behavior and legislation. So that was a very fertile and creative legislative period to invent antitrust law. Um, I, you know, it didn't, it, it didn't happen like that, as I'm sure many of you realize. Uh, there were cartels and there were monopolies and they were a scourge on society and there was tremendous uh, contest and violence. And these laws and regulatory visions were developed by progressives and by uh, legal scholars uh, over a period of decades. And it was a tremendously creative act. So, you know, there's, a, there's wonderful histories of regulation. And one of the lessons um, these histories of regulation is that regula regulatory efforts fail when they are unable to frame regulatory strategies that are carefully based on an understanding of the industry that they're trying to regulate. And I think the same can be said on the larger scale now for surveillance capitalism. So let me connect those two points. Number one, it simply can't be a question of taking that very creative legislative work that came out of the 20th century and applying it to a wholly new set of mechanisms and methods, problems and phenomena in the 21st century. Do we have anti-competitive behavior among these com companies? Yes. Do we have monopoly behavior? Yes. Will addressing those monopolies uh, undo, will it interrupt and outlaw surveillance capitalism? No, not in my view. What it's more likely to do, breaking them up, quote unquote, uh, we run the risk of creating more surveillance capitalist companies, intensifying competition among surveillance capitalists, and therefore intens intensifying the drive towards certainty and, and predictability that I've just been describing to you. So what I believe is that we need to stand on the shoulders of 20th century antitrust law, 20th century, and even early 21st century privacy law, and we need to build on that with specific understanding of surveillance capitalism's logic, its methods, its mechanisms, its imperatives, and having a new creative effort that produces the insight, the legislation, the regulatory vision that will interrupt and outlaw what is unprecedented here. Okay, thank you. Next question, but I, <laughs> I can't see you. Wanted. Can you raise your hand? I'm here. You're there, okay, there you are, hi. I'm gonna stand up. Um, so yeah, maybe that's better, thank you. You're welcome. Um, the second block is about more in the, what can we personally do to combat the threats? Um, for example, Anonymous asked, um, which actions we can take to uh, make sure we are not entirely influenced by such companies as Google and Facebook? And also on a more personal level, which actions do you personally take to minimize the data you provide to tech companies? Well, you know, I, I've, I've argued that privacy is not private. <coughs> so, there are a couple things here. One is, my personal view is that withdrawing from such a dependency and enmeshment in these systems uh, will give you a better life <laughs> and better mental health. Um, 
even before uh, the rise of the digital, I was never the kind of person who was very attuned to the others. And I certainly um, would avoid the amplification of that kind of dynamic that we see now in the online milieu. Um, so I think we can do things for ourselves by, by withdrawing and, and by you know, not being so dependent on these systems, uh, not being so mediated. I do believe in <laughs> eye contact and uh, you know, I do believe in actual recognition <laughs> Um, and I do believe in uh, being in the presence of trees and things like that. So, but what does it mean privacy is not private? Does it mean that we have no power as individuals? No. It means that our, our real challenge as individuals now is political. So to say that privacy is a collective action pro, uh, problem means that friends, we need new forms of collective action. So, you know, in the, in the 19th century, and in the, especially in the, the first part of the 20th century, this was about, you know, the, the right to have a union, and the right to bargain collectively, and the right to strike. Uh, it was about making sure that children didn't work, didn't go to work when they were seven or 13, but they went to school or they were with their families because that was consistent with the aspirations of a democratic society. So what are the forms of collective action that will define our challenges in our time? So collective action means that we need to discover ourselves not as anonymous users, which is their name for us, but rather as citizens of democratic societies with shared, not only economic, but political and social and psychological interests. And we have to come together in those interests and create these new forms that are going ultimately to be the vehicles that put pressure on our lawmakers, that mobilize our lawmakers into this next era of, uh, of creativity and a new regulatory vision. Uh, so we have work as individuals and that work is coming together to create these new movements. Um, and these, these will be movements defined by uh, the fight for epistemic justice. Thank you. Okay, just a small announcement. I know we're running a little bit late. I thought we had a conversation up here for 20 minutes, and then it's your turn for 20 minutes, and I think we're going to stick with that. So uh, we have another about 12 minutes, maybe, until this evening will end a little bit late. But, uh, you know, the subject is so huge, and our speaker is great, so I think uh, we can all deal with that. I can, certainly. So I think there'll be one more question for the moment from Slido, and then we'll go to the microphone uh, on both sides. Please, Natalie. Great. Uh, so we have a top-voted question uh, by far, which is more about the organizational part of the event. Uh, the event is co-organized by the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, which received millions of funding by Google. Do you think that this is a problem? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, years ago, when I was a little girl, um, there was a, a wonderful thinker, Herbert Marcuse, who wrote a book called The One-Dimensional Society. Um, people don't really read it that much these days, but I recommend it. <laughs> you read it. <laughs> so this is 
our version of the one-dimensional society, you know, Google's out there whitewashing itself in every way imaginable, including uh, if you look at the list of Google fellows year after year, it's all kinds of people who are from civil society institutions that should be dead set against Google. Um, and instead, they're Google fellows, and they're, they're, they fund conferences, and they fund... Um, uh, civil society organizations, and uh, this is part of the whitewashing that is intended to keep us so confused. You know, it's like I said before, Mark Zuckerberg just told us that the, you know, the future is privacy. Uh, what? What did you just say, Mark? So, you know, they, they think we're stupid, and we're supposed to be confused, and we're supposed to think that um, they're really nice. But uh, I don't think that, and, I'm, and I wish that they weren't a sponsor of this event. Um, to be honest, perfectly honest, uh, I didn't know this until a little while ago, <laughs> a few days ago, uh, but um, I, I have been at other events, other events that I was very proud of, including um, the... Um, um, CPDP event in Brussels, where we launched my book in January, which is also, you know, Google is still a sponsor there, and there, there are some folks who refused to go to that meeting because it was sponsored by Google, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a calculation, it's a choice, uh, cost-benefit, you know, better to go, be with you, share a message, or better to stand on my principles and not come here and be silent. So that's, that's how I calculate the cost benefit, but I'm not happy about it. I just maybe have to say something to that. I'm not, um, I'm not on the payroll of the HIIG, so to speak, but I work for them. And uh, just to give a little bit background information, the institute was uh, founded by uh, different universities here in Berlin, not by Google. And I think in the board of five people or six people, there's one Google guy. That's just to give you an impression. I think it's 1.5 million euros a year that the institute gets from Google. That's about, in good years, that's about half of the budget. 1.5 at the most is uh, the other kind of Trittmittel, uh, the other funding I, uh, they're able to gather. Sometimes <laughs> it's less. Just to give you a couple of numbers on that. Um, there's a microphone. On this side, is there one on the other side too? You see, that's the problem because this is so packed and we don't have aisles and everything. It's really hard to handle the microphone. This is one of the reasons we opted for Slido, like back in the day at, uh, uh, at the Kino International with Castells. That's part of the reason. Okay, how are we going to do this? That's on. That's on. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm Danny Stockman. I'm a professor here at the Herdy School of Governance. Um, I'm wondering whether you could speak to alternative business models to the surveillance capitalism for tech companies to use in the future. Thanks. Well, <clears throat> you know, I think, um, for example, um, I think it, it could be, you know, possibly quite useful to have some of the devices that are characteristic of what people call a smart home. Manage energy efficiency and uh, communicate with um, distant family and uh, make sure old folks are, are safe aging in their homes and all these things. So. There were, there were folks in the early 2000s who were developing these models of a, of a smart home. And when they did that, they were drawing schematics of how it would work, and it was a closed loop. It had a, devices in the walls that were generating information, and all that information was channeled to the occupants of the home who received it on a little wearable computer, and um, it was a closed loop. Then you fast forward to 2017, a very interesting legal analysis of one Nest thermostat. Nest, smart home devices. Now, it was bought by Google, now there's no more Nest, it's all Google Home. One Nest thermostat, these legal scholars figured out, if you're even just a casually vigilant 
consumer and you install one thermostat, they recommend you review a minimum of 1,000 privacy contracts. So I don't think we have to look that far for business models. The problem is that without the surveillance dividend, it's going to be very hard to monetize a refrigerator that's not secretly sending data to my health insurance company. Right? Just like Ford Motor can't figure out how to make money without streaming data from the folks driving his cars, right? And that becomes the basis for revenues and profit. I think if if we could actually see our way to eliminating that overhang, the, the business model is the least of our problems. I have uh, at least a hundred messages in my inbox out of several hundred every day that are people who are working on great ideas. This piece of technology, this kind of product, this kind of service, that's not surveillance capitalism. How do I do it? How do I get it funded? I don't think we have any problem with business models. The question is making space in the competitive landscape so that business models can get the funding and the uh, capital that they, that they need to sustain. Thank you. I think we got one more question from the floor. Yes. Hey, my name is Rafael. I was actually Danny's student and I used to be a Google fellow, but I swear that I'm not <laughs> defending any sites. Uh, I work for civil society nowadays and we look into uh, the impact of social media in, around elections in the world. So not only Europe, but in Asia and Africa, many countries. Yeah, yeah. And what is interesting to see is that uh, the decision to counter the risks of which each election is basically a PR campaign. So you're going to, of course, invest a lot of money in the US, in Brazil, in India, because they're big democracies, and uh, the effects uh, of any bad PR will go to the company, but they don't look into other countries that are smaller or smaller markets. So basically, you have this asymmetry of a very, like, an US-based uh, company deciding which democracy values more than others, basically. So in that sense, uh, my question goes in two ways. So you mentioned about the, the, this, this infrastructure generating predictions about behavior. So you have basically inside of those companies probably 98% of the efforts towards that and 2% towards countering the, the, the effects, the negative effects of that. First of all, regulation is enough to really solve this if you consider this global scale of companies. And second of all, how can you really make sense of this uh, uh, rising global inequalities in terms of democratic standards. I wanted to ask more, but it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that last part got a little uh, yeah, smushed together. Like the the uh, idea that like some democracies value more than others, and oh, yeah, how do you make yeah, sense okay. of... Well, Liz, what's your name? Rafael. What? Rafael. Rafael. Yeah. I love that name. Um, <laughs> that's my son's middle name, Rafael. Um, Look, if, the, if they were choosing to look out for democracy in India and Brazil, they didn't do a very good job. So if that's what we get when they're actually trying to do something, then, you know, <laughs> I don't buy it. I mean, all, all they had to do was um, intervene in WhatsApp in Brazil and uh, it's clear that the outcome would have been different or at least I think there's compelling evidence to suggest that the outcome would have been very different. So um, I'm not sure that they're really looking out for democracy anywhere uh, on that part of your question. Um, what was the other part of your question? Oh yeah, uh, what was the other part of your question? <laughs> what? Oh yeah, yeah. So. Um, Look, uh, this, is, this is where I'm talking about regulatory vision and creativity for a new era. So we're talking about a war now between computational governance and democratic governance. The computational governance side says democracy is too slow. Democracy limits innovation. Uh, democracy can never keep up. Uh, and the democratic side says, 
You bet democracy's slow. Slow is good. Slow means we're deliberating and we're creating some kind of consensus. And uh, the idea that democracy is bad for innovation, that's some kind of really crap piece of propaganda that was actually invented by J.P. Morgan in the late 19th century. J.P. Morgan loved to say, uh, capitalism doesn't need law. We've got the law of supply and demand, and we've got the law of survival of the fittest. We don't need any more laws. <laughs> so the idea that law is somehow you know, bad for innovation, bad for business, that's just an old piece of propaganda that's just been recycled. Um, the idea that uh, market actors should be completely free, uh, that maybe has had a certain amount of merit when Adam Smith was writing, because when Adam Smith was writing, the hand really was invisible. Not for long. <laughs> but today, the hand is not invisible. These cats know everything. So uh, they actually know too much to qualify for freedom. So that argument is gone. So the point is, part of a democratic regulatory vision is to say, it is not okay, for example, to have political advertising that is patently false. It is not okay to have videos of elected officials that are known to be false. It is not okay to have a virus without a vaccine. These things are simply not compatible with how democracies have to run. And so, can we regulate that? Yes, we can. Can we do that without that being turned into censorship? I believe we can. That's where the imagination now you know, that's the, that's the front line now. But we, we see the alternative and it's uh, unacceptable. Thank you, Shoshana. What we usually do in this area is please. <laughs> I'm not quite done yet. <laughs> I'm not quite done yet. What we usually do at the very end uh, uh, in this series is um, ask, uh, you know, uh, ask about the European perspective. Because you know probably in Germany there's the Netzdigi, the Network Enforcement Act that goes colloquial by the name of the Facebook law. Uh, basically make it easier um, to force platforms to remove hate speech, for instance. Uh, it is a set of compliance rules, uh, more or less. Then there's the right to forget on a European level, things like that. Now, there is the usual European conceit, you know, that borders on feelings of uh, moral superiority. I'm sure you know what I mean. And there's those who think, ah, forget it. We do not have enough power in this new emerging world order anyways. Now, what's your take on the European perspective of agency in that matter uh, from the U.S.? Well, you know, when I, when I first met uh, Frank Schirmacher and I began writing for the, the FATS in 2013, I told him then that I, I wanted to write for him because uh, Europe was the front line. And Europe still is the front line. So if we are going to make progress on the things that we've been talking about this evening, I do believe that that progress will be made here first. And um, I don't know that we have to call it moral superiority. I simply think that Europe has had a different experience than America. Mm -hmm. And uh, World War II is an important part of that. And uh, what our societies learned from the devastation of that time uh, you know, is different and has played out differently in our, in our different uh, European and American civilizations. And uh, I do believe that uh, in many ways, Europe understands that 
democracy has to be defended and fought for in every generation. I was doing a book signing uh, a few months ago in America, and um, this you know long line, and I'm c kind of got my head down. And a beautiful young woman comes, and we sign. And <coughs> what's your name? And tells me her name, and she says, "I'm very depressed. Your talk really, really made me sad." And I said, "Oh my, why, are, why are you depressed? What, what happened? Why did I make you sad?" And she said, "Well." I, I've, you know, I've lost faith in democracy. And, I, and I, I, we talked about it a little bit. And I said, you know, you've just given me an insight that I didn't have before. That for someone your age, you know, especially coming of age, eight years of Obama or whatever, it's like you're looking at democracy like it's a mountain, like it's a boulder. And it's there when you're born, and it will be there when you die, just exactly the same. But that's not what democracy is. Democracy is a creature of human imagination and will. And every generation has to keep it going. It's like those, the kids, before there were toys, kids would throw a hoop, you know, and then you had to run over the hoop and to make sure it didn't wobble and fall over. Well, democracy is like that hoop and you've got to run after it and make sure it doesn't wobble and fall over. It's everybody's responsibility in every generation. And I think that Europeans have learned that in a way that perhaps Americans uh, have not had to learn it in the same way. I mean, my father learned it, but, you know, I'm not sure that, we, that Americans have had to learn it generation after generation in the same way. So... Um, so I do think that Europe uh, has a unique vantage point and that has been, Europe has been and will continue to be the vanguard in this work. Um, and that's an important reason why I've been so committed to this work in Germany and, and in Europe. I didn't know I was fishing for this, but it's sure nice to hear. So, uh, <laughs> thank you, Shoshana Tsubo, for being with us, despite your illness, despite uh, your cold. Thank you for being with us. Shoshana Tsubo.